It's the usual suspects, kind of. <laughs> Welcome all. Um, we're currently at a panel discussion, so if you expected anything else, we're not. <laughs> cool. Um, can I hand you the mic? And the one for you. And you passed around. So we're currently at a panel discussion, so. a bit about what Dries had in his keynote about open source, how the landscape is changing, how we collaborate and how we compete. So all kinds of questions. It's interactive. So do ask any question that you want. As a starter, I have some backup questions, which I'm going to ask in a moment. But first, not give more warm hand, but just introduce yourself in a tweet. What, who are you and where should we know you from? Starting with you, mister. Uh, <laughs> all right. Dries, project lead of Drupal. You know me from the previous, one of the previous presentations. Matthias, uh, Typo3 CMS product project ambassador. You also know me from a previous talk, probably, but otherwise you probably don't know me. I'll take this one. Um, Johan, um, Joomla co-founder in a, in a, a lifetime ago. Uh, today, probably uh, open source hacker and, and tech entrepreneur is probably more accurate. My name is Patrick Jenner. I'm uh, actually a solution architect, so independent from any kind of uh, open source uh, tooling, but been active in uh, open source, uh, well, actually starting it in 2000 when I worked for Sun Microsystems. And since about 2009, I've been very actively involved in all kinds of uh, open source communities, visiting a lot of uh, events, so maybe you know me from this. Hi, my name is Emil Brock. I am open source ambassador at SUSE. Um, about 20 plus years um, lobbying for open source in governmental and uh, financial institutions. And my name is Ben van Ende. I'm an independent community manager. I've been uh, doing, of being introduced with community management at Typo3. And uh, lately I've been doing community management for uh, Aliander, a Dutch uh, energy provider, and LF Energy. Cool. Thank you so much. Can you give him a warm hand? Come on. <laughs> Thank you so much. My name is Bert Boerland. I don't tweet anymore, so that's my introduction. That's all I'm going to say. Um, so we have some questions, but is there someone who thinks, hey, I have a very, 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 very urgent question already? <coughs> And, and then you know the 20 seconds rule, of course. If I'm being silent for 20 seconds, someone will say, oh, please, yeah. Nine, 10, okay, skip that. Um, one of the questions that we have is, PHP is Drupal's Achilles heel. Well, it's not a question, it's a statement. <laughs> <laughs> I, put a, I put a question mark behind it. <laughs> but uh, can, can, you, can you take the mic uh, and... And, and elaborate on what you uh, meant by that. Okay, so I, I put toga together what, um, what Bert called a couple of bommekes, mm -hmm. and this is probably one of them. Now, um, so the context of that statement is basically that uh, what we're seeing is that popularity of PHP, not necessarily in terms of how many sites there are, right? Because then you always look 75 percentage. But popularity in PHP in numbers of contributions, people actually contributing to PHP as the language, not building on the PHP. Um, even building on PHP is declining. So 2012, 15% of GitHub was basically working on PHP, a lot of contributions there. And today, that's 5%-ish. Um, that same trend you see in Ruby, in Ruby too. So Ruby has done that same trend. And you also see that in recent years, there's less and less contribution to the PHP core. We lost a couple of uh, very, um, very skilled PHP core developers, uh, people like, um, uh, like Nikki, Nikita, uh, that uh, left recently. Um, so there's less and less interest in the language PHP, and that could become a little bit problematic for, well, Drupal, Typo, and projects that build upon it in user land, because PHP still needs to remain maintained. So that's, in a sense, the statement. Um, there could be actually opportunity there. Ben, you work also at a PHP-driven community CMS, right? 
Yeah, it, it, there's not too much that I personally can say about uh, the programming language itself. I, I, I do see uh, the same tendency, but maybe I also kind of agree with what Dries said earlier, that this has been said like 20 years ago already. Yeah, like, I mean, it, like, honestly, from the day I started Drupal, people were, like, bashing PHP. And, like, there's been all these waves, and people will be like, well, me, who uses PHP? PHP is for, like, amateurs, and, like, oh. But at the same time, I think it's, I'm not denying there's a, a downward trend with PHP, first of all. I think that is true, but um, I think it's also what made Drupal really successful. The fact that people could get started with Drupal easily, it was accessible, it was affordable, all of these things. So I think all these things are still true. Uh, for a large, to a large extent, so. So, to, to get it right, uh, so it's not about the popularity of PHP itself. No, um, it's new code being written. Uh, and the maintenance of the language in, in itself, right? I, when we did Joomla, we kind of like had this idea that we don't care like how big it gets, we are kind of like having fun in hacking and building and putting things out there. Uh, it grew to a certain size and that was actually a nice, a nice a after effect. Um, so the popularity of PHP and how many people use it is not necessarily what I'm worried about. It's more if you use it and you're building business on top of it, you are becoming dependent on it. And you're also relying on the fact that it gets well maintained, uh, it moves forward. And we are seeing less and less people building on it, which also means that less and less people are gonna be interested to actually contribute to PHP core. Well, Everybody can through the RFP process. Um, so that could become, uh, it's a little bit of a, it's a tricky thing, right? For years, we as PHP communities have built on PHP without actually contributing to PHP. Right? Yeah, I, I think we, we have missed an important uh, opportunity and an, an important perspective. Uh, while we've been happily using uh, PHP that has, as Dries says, kind of, it's never been cool, right? But it's been a, a really good basis to build software on. And PHP has gotten a lot better in the last uh, few years. I think a lot of the old arguments against PHP are now moot because, well, I mean, look at PHP 8. I mean, there's so much great stuff that's come in there. The speed of 7, you know, it's light years apart from 5.5. From five. But what we haven't talked about is which uh, programming language is actually PHP. Well, PHP is built in C, and there's quite a ocean or a sea <laughs> between <laughs> PHP developers and C developers. And uh, we need to talk about how we can close that gap because the future of PHP is not only in adoption, it's about making sure that we actually have developers who can work on the core. Uh, and that's a very different way of thinking. I don't have the perfect answer to it. I've heard here from the Netherlands as well about making a PHP association or foundation that is more for the community supporting the development, not the existing PHP foundation. But yeah, how can we make sure that people who don't program in PHP can find PHP and do the C development? That's to that, if anyone else. So for context, if you don't really know like how the PHP is built in C and is a very complex thing, like there's not much documentation about PHP internals. If you try to understand and read about how to build a PHP extension, it gets really complex really fast. So you have a very small group of people that know how PHP internally works. And that small group of people is getting smaller. Um, a contribution from Nikita, Nikita, did approximately, I looked it up this morning, 10,000 commits, which is an enormous amount of knowledge um, that the PHP community lost. The RFP process that PHP has means that everybody individually can scratch his own itch, which is very free software-ish. Uh, they can contribute if there's enough votes for it. But if that person leaves after a while, that knowledge about how that specific feature was built also leaves. Is that as a complex feature like a JIT compiler and the person leaves who build it, it becomes really hard to maintain and, and, um, and replace that or evolve that feature. And there's the Achilles heel there, in a sense. I, I do think the PHP community is taking some good steps, like they have the PHP Foundation now, which is great. So they, 
only in the last year and a half, I think, organized themselves more like maybe Typo3 and, and Drupal and, and other open source communities. They have raised money. And by the way, Acquia has contributed money to it. And so like maybe indirectly Drupal, uh, you know, I think we, s we, we give them like $50,000, I think, a year. And that money is being used to hire full-time or part-time uh, PHP um, developers, people that contribute to PHP. And I feel, again, I'm not denying some of the trends, but I do feel like there's been a little bit of a PHP renaissance, to be quite honest. I've seen a lot of like exciting new capabilities and features come out of PHP. And so, you know, they're making some good moves, some smart moves that I think will help with the sustainability and longevity of PHP and hopefully lead to a reacceleration of PHP as well. If that's going to happen or not, I don't know, but um, we'll see. So I feel actually better now than I felt three years ago, in a way. So, you know, because I feel like they have better infrastructure and they've been funding some, some new things that they hadn't funded. Patrick, anything you want to add to the C? Yeah, probably to the C. Um, well, let's, let's not forget, one of the, or the most popular languages nowadays are uh, React, Node.js, Angular. Um, but they're all based on JavaScript. And JavaScript's been there for, for about 20, 25 years, maybe so. Um, that means that JavaScript is already mature. Nothing has been actually evolved in the development of JavaScript, uh, just new libraries making it easier. And so is, is PHP. PHP is already mature as well. So you need to have more building blocks for PHP, which is Drupal, of course, being one of the, the easiest building blocks to, to create something. So, and, and, and also, let's not forget, we still have COBOL developers. They exist, so we won't die. Uh, well, maybe I'll, <laughs> I'll try to counter that a little bit. I agree with you, but, but there is another one. Um, while that is true, um, the JavaScript actually is on the way down. Um, it's actually interesting. I looked up the trends. Which language is now actually going down and which language is going up? Um, and the languages going up are, are, are hard typed languages. Ty JavaScript goes down, TypeScript goes up. Uh, languages going up is a language like Go. Go is making enormous, uh, an enormous jump as a hard typed compiled language. Uh, developers are looking for outside of PHP, looking for startups, are looking for languages with, high, with very performant concurrency models. Uh, Node has that, but Go is simply faster. Um, so what we're seeing is, and this is also a worry, but it's another point that I made, there is an enormous amount of like dead code out there in the Node community. If you start looking at a lot of the Node projects, which were one very thriving and very well built, and there's people maintaining it, and you go look at MPN or you go look at GitHub, who has still contributed to that in the past couple of years, there is code out there that has been dead for three, four years. No, people are not interested anymore. This is a serious issue because if you rely on that library and there's nobody maintaining it, uh, that's another Achilles heel and it's another, uh, it's another point you don't want to get into. Uh, Go has the same problem though, PHP has the same problem. Uh, Go solves the problem by saying everything is 100% backwards compatible so I can use code from seven years ago. Um, so while I agree with what you're saying, is one, one of those problems is, is that in any of the languages, not only PHP, there is an, there's an enormous amount of, there's code waste. Because people got interested at some point to build something and then stepped out of it, so yeah, not really see having the intent, interest anymore to maintain this. Uh, we see that everywhere. And you see those languages then lose contributors and interest on, on GitHub. On a positive note, <laughs> <laughs> um, the landscape of open source is rather fast changing due to uh, um, some open source companies that changing the line systems. Uh, I mean, Terraform and, and, and a competitor of my uh, employer, uh, Red Hat, have been changing the landscape a lot. Um, is open source still still a thing, um, Sousa? Sorry, <laughs> Emil. <laughs> Sorry, that came out wrong. <laughs> Emil, what do you? Th What's your thoughts on that? Why should open source, is, is the future still open source? I really believe that the world will be a lot more beautiful place if all software would be open source. So I will keep on uh, going for that. Um, regarding the dilution of uh, open source licensing of uh, how 
companies try to dilute um, the definition of giving the code to the public is something which is worrying me. Uh, there are several articles about open source washing. So what you see is that uh, several companies in uh, open source, they still uh, tell everyone that they are open source, but how open are they really? Like if you define a user as only a customer, then you only give the code to the uh, uh, to your customer and not to GitHub, not to the public. That, for me, is a dilution of open source. Um, it is still within the GPL license, so there is nothing uh, we can say about that. But if you look at the, the, the heart of open source, in the presentation of Matthias earlier on here, he made a great um, comparison and an analogy. He said, proprietary is like a, a desert and uh, open source is like a jungle. If you see what some companies in the open source industry are doing, it is going more to the desert because then they do not give the user the opportunity anymore to work together, to collide, to grow, to develop. That is my personal opinion. Ben, you're active in one of the open source software products as well as using GPL, I think. Um, how, how, would, how would you resonate on that? Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to quickly react on that, uh, and also what Matthias was saying, you know, the, well, from what I've seen, you know, also with the, uh, the, the company driven culture is that they don't make any time for collaboration. So uh, the past year I've been working for uh, Aliander and some of the Linux Foundation energy projects and I've definitely seen there. You know, everybody calls it open source and I mean the, the, the intention is there to collaborate but they just don't make any time for it because they're so company driven, you know. Every end of the quarter there needs to be a result, you know, the 20% uh, higher gain of whatever. So the, uh, I think there really needs to be a focus on, uh, on collaboration. But I also understand, you know, that all, uh, a community management perspective is sometimes difficult to put into, uh, uh, into numbers, you know. It's easier to, uh, to, uh, to have your sales figures then uh, how do we do better in collaboration? Dries, I think your company has end uh, quarter races as well. How do you, how do you make <laughs> of sure? Of course we do. Yeah, <laughs> how do you make sure that, that doing good and doing well are yeah. combined? I mean, I think it's part of our culture. So we, well, first of all, I'll answer that too. But like, I think open source is still a thing, first of all. I think, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear an applause. <laughs> yeah, just saying, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Good news, guys. <laughs> I mean, I think open source has won, like as a technology um, solution, I guess. But I think the business model of open source, we're still trying to crack the code there because not that many open source businesses that do collaborate, that do allow time for contribution. So, I mean, the way we do it at Acquia, you know, we have a lot of open source, but we also have some non-open source, by the way. But... Um, it's part of our DNA, our culture. So we actually wrote down our DNA, our culture, and um, what we have five statements. One of them is give back more. And this is born out of open source because Acquia was born out of open source and we embedded it in our culture to give back more than we receive or we try to. And that's not just to open source, but can also to the local communities where we have offices or employees, those kinds of things. And we use a combination of techniques, like we allow people, you know, X hours a week to contribute. Uh, we also have a team of people that we pay to contribute full time. That's all they do, or almost all they do, uh, is contribute to back to Drupal. Um, and so I think you just have to build it into the culture. But I think it's hard for like business leaders to establish that culture if they didn't grow yeah. up in open source or were born out yeah. of open source. Yeah, so I think I, I, it takes people like us yeah. to get to leadership roles yeah. where we can enforce these things because it's not natural. Like, you know, it's not natural to contribute to open source for many people. Yeah. 
Um, but I guess that's so. typically it. I mean, we uh, we are very much used to being green roots uh, uh, projects, uh, grassroots projects like Type 3. So we've kind of grown up with the whole idea uh, that we do this for collaborative uh, purposes. But you see companies coming in you know, and, and kind of uh, taking that whole idea of open source, but not having that ingrained uh, you know, in, their, in their culture. Maybe there's something we can do to teach them. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've, I've been saying a lot, uh, actually, the opposite of what you said. We haven't won, uh, actually. We think we might have won, but we haven't won. And one example of that is that we're still teaching normal business practices, competition-based practices in schools. We don't learn open source in school. And I don't mean coding, but I mean the concepts of how open source can actually work. And I had a... In, in some way, a, a sort of uh, a revelatory experience uh, visiting an embassy in Papua New Guinea on a visit there and talking about open source. I had a 45-minute appointment with a diplomat there, and I spent 30 of those minutes just trying to convince her that open source was at all possible. Uh, and people out there don't know it very well. That's one thing. The other thing is... We're still finding our way, and I just want to, to give a big start to Mautic as well, who we just went through this big process of how are we going to organize our open source project, and they've actually open sourced all of their thoughts and all of their models and all of the ways that they think open source projects should be organized. So, yeah, we also have a lot we need to learn about what open source really is. Um, so maybe the problem is that open source as a term, covers so much. Um, there is, right now when everybody talks about, when people talk about open source, and I also ask the question, like, are we talking about open source or free software? Or do we consider open source to be free software? That, that ideological difference is already there. Um, I follow you, you're talking about collaboration and the power that open source brings in an environment, a community environment or a corporate environment for collaboration. And the practices there, which we have learned that, that they work. How do you explain that to somebody? For me, open source, for you, open source is a challenging collaboration. For somebody else, it's a legal challenge. You have the whitewashing problem, where specifically with AIs right now, right? A lot of AI companies that need to spend an enormous amount of money to train models, and they figuring out that putting those models out there for free so that we as free software developers can use them freely is a problem because they cost an enormous amount of money to train. Uh, and it's one of the statements that I also made. Zuck has said, if you follow AI a little bit, you have the Llama model from Facebook, right? Which is freely available, it's just really great, it's really good, it's very competitive with ChatGDP. Um, but Zuck has clearly said that we're making it available under a free license and we're making it freely available as long as it makes sense for Facebook to do so. So as it doesn't make sense anymore for Facebook, then yeah, they will probably put it behind the paywall or they will stop releasing free versions of it. Um, so there's the clear challenges there, um, and in AI it's not that clear cut. Uh, it's, yeah, we want to start open source and we want to get adoption and we want to collaborate with people, but then there's this cost component to it, which is kind of similar as like trying to build software in the, in, the, in the 60s in a sense, right? You had to like rent space or rent time on this big ass mainframe to get a little software run, and that's a little bit similar. It costs a lot of money. And there is the ideology in between there, right? How does that infect us? What does it do with open source? How do you convince people of that? There is so much that covers that term. I have one more thought. Um, so I think it's actually super exciting right now to be part of open source startups as well as open source nonprofit foundations. And the reason is because what I said is like, you know, I said open source as one as a technology. What I mean is, most organizations are comfortable using open source, they use open source, but the big next problem, and it's not a new problem, is how do we make open source organizations, projects and businesses succeed and scale and sustainable? Like we need to figure out sort of the business model of open source so that every company can become an open source company. Like think about it, there's probably a million technology companies in the world I'm going to say, I'm making up numbers here, but <laughs> I'm going to say 20,000 of those are open source businesses. 
Like it's a fraction of all of the technology companies in the world. And if we can figure out sort of the business model for companies to be true open source businesses that collaborate and give back, I think that would unlock like amazing things. And I think the people that are trying right now are the nonprofit foundations, uh, are the open source startups are trying new ways to um, make money with open source and in the process give back to open source. I think it's personally, I think it's like, I'm kind of excited to be alive uh, for those, for, for that, you know, really. I th because I think, I think about the impact that that would have on the world. You know, if, if much more software becomes open source and we solve problems in the open source way. And I even think about how that could then be applied to other problems in the world. Like we have huge issues like climate change, which is like a little bit like open source <laughs> in the sense that we have, it's like a massive multi-stakeholder problem where all the countries in the world need to collaborate to go fix climate change. And it's like, like the way to solve that is, I think they can actually learn a lot from open source, you know, because we are like people all around the world that come together to go solve a problem. Um, and so I think, yeah, I just feel very passionate about making open source work, like commercially. Can I throw a question in, Bert? Uh, sure. Take over your... Sure. <laughs> so I don't, don't statement. But sh so f for you guys, does that, should we do a different license? Do we need to change the way we work with licenses? Do licenses need to change? We've been working with the GPL for 30 I years think and it, I think has limitations. I think one way to make it work is to evolve the licensing, yeah. I think there is very, like the GPL license which Drupal uses, I think typo 3.2. I mean, it's basically, what, 25 years old? A lot has changed in 25 years and we haven't really kind of updated the license, which I think there's opportunities to help the sustainability of open source by changing the license. And some projects have experimented with this, like I think Maria DB did something where they keep things closed source, I think, for six months, then open source it. I don't know, I could be wrong, but there is like different tweaks, I guess, that are still, I think, true to the spirit of open source, but allow a few more options for sustainability. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, well, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, well, the, the thing with licenses is they, they are evolving, um, and, and especially nowadays when we see a lot of uh, uh, software as a service. So you have a website and there's an application behind it. Um, it could be open source, could not be open source, doesn't really matter, but you pay subscriptions for it or you pay some, some amount at least. So, and also with open source, there's always a discussion on uh, where to make money and how to get money. Um, so we are evolving still. Um, but the thing with open source is the, the, the true definition of open source is getting the source code of an application of, of software. And you own it, you can contribute to it, you can change it. That's still the main important thing. Um, the other thing with open source is it's open. And the word open means a lot more than just open source. It means the openness of it all. It means the friendliness. Um, open meetings, but also uh, using open standards, using open data. There's a lot more involved in just the terminology of open source and uh, what the license does and what it costs. Yeah, and uh, I mean, license is one side of it, but you know, if you look at the license as the law of the land, and you know, different countries have different laws, but they work pretty well still, uh, and, and people make different choices. But at the same time, there isn't only the license that defines a country that is working well. It's also the collaboration culture um, and how do we choose to interpret the law. And I think today we have some movements in relation to, to open source licenses where it's not about how can we do open source best for open source. It's about how can we tweak the license into you know, doing what we want. Uh, and I, I think that's, uh, that's where the, the licenses really stop and you get to a point where it's really about the importance of discussing where we want, like we're doing now actually, where do we want open source to be in, in 10 years? Do we want it to go down that street or do we want it to go down that street? And then rather than necessarily agreeing on the same license, agreeing on the same direction of the projects and how we want to collaborate. 
regarding licensing is quite interesting because I spoke to a lawyer of us uh, last week and she told me that um, when she's going to other uh, partners or customers of us, uh, large enterprise customers, that she spends a lot more than she wants to in explaining the difference between proprietary and open source uh, software. So they are used to put complete responsibility on the, uh, uh, on, the, on, on the vendor, on us. It's not possible if you are uh, delivering uh, open source software or services around open source software. So um, when you look at awareness creation of the difference between open source and proprietary or the, the versions in between, it's very important that we don't only look at the technology uh, schools at IT education, but that we also look at lawyers. So, well, we cannot improve the whole world at once. So, for example, what we as Susie do, I heard it last week from her, is she going back to the study where she finished her, um, uh, her study as a lawyer, and she is now doing their uh, explanation about open source licensing, how it is for a lawyer to talk about um, the reliabilities um, for uh, closing a contract with an open source company. Ben, anything you want to add there? No? Dries, can I ask you per one person before we move on? Dries, can you, you said you wanted to m maybe think about, rethink about the license, the GPL in this case, right? What would you add without subtracting any of the four freedoms that we have? I mean, I, I don't know, really. Um, like, you know, I, I would have to think about that more. And you may have to compromise a little bit on the four freedoms. Um, so, you know, um, like I said, like, ideas are like you delay making something open source for a certain amount of time so that, you know, some people can get access to the code before others, and there's some value in that. Um, like, the, I think the open core model has been an interesting model for some organizations where you can open source a lot of your software, but you keep a number of closed source components that can supercharge maybe an open source project. That's been an interesting model that people are using, uh, and some successfully. Um, I think there's been other experiments, um, you know. So, like even like automatic in a way, um, you know, like they like they, they leverage trademarks and domain names to build a business around WordPress. You know, because they can own and control WordPress.com, as an example. So that's an interesting model, and that doesn't take away any of the four freedoms. Uh, so that's an interesting one. So I think there's a, a variety of different things. Um, there's a couple of other things, but I'm I'm blanking on them now. Um, but it's 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 actually interesting. A, a bunch of people are doing ex license innovation, I guess I would call it. Uh, but of course, it's always somewhat controversial uh, with sort of the free software. Um, you know, freedoms. Um. Yeah, for example, I know a company uh, that doesn't compile anymore, but you just get the source code, but you have to compile it yourself, which is makes sense mm -hmm. in a way as well. Of course, we have to reinvent it because after 30 years, something like that, we still haven't figured out actually how to have sustainable, well, it sounds weird after 30 years, but have a for the future sustainable module, right? Cool. Uh, can I add something to sure, that? Sure, sure, sure. Um, who knows the Pandabot? Uh, who uses it? Oh, yeah. Who knows the license it uses, at least until two weeks ago? No. Uh, it's free licensed by GitHub to, MI to MIT. It uses this um, interesting license called the profanity, the profanity license. Uh, the idea behind the license is a little bit open core-ish in that sense, uh, where the Pendable basically said that you can use this for free for 30 days, uh, and even then you can continue using it. But if you're using it in a commercial context, you need to start paying for it. And there's a couple of... Um, individual indie developers, because you can look at this problem from a bigger perspective. You can also look at it from an individual indie developer, open source developer perspective that just wants to create open source and make it available. Uh, indie developers that started using this, they basically said that if you want to use my software, fine, it's free, available under those four freedoms and I'm not going to change that. It's not open core, uh, there is no limitations. But if you start making money for it, I also want to profit from that because it allows me to do what I do best and you can do what you do best. Uh, if you're an individual not profiting, great, then here it is. 
and then there's a couple people in the community now that make an exception to that and they say, and if you contribute, you get it for free whatsoever. So if you can show that you have made a couple of pull requests, you have made a, a significant contribution, then yeah, you don't need to pay because you're contributing. Maybe putting that in a more direct verbal way into a license makes it clearer to people to understand that, hey, you know, this is not free beer, it's free software, it's freedom, but still, we need to also make a living out of it to build it. There are multiple models. Uh, the discussion, because it's opening up some of the, the really interesting topics around how to run open source projects, uh, which was why I mentioned Mautic earlier as well. But it is just, you know, to your example, uh, not everyone are developers. Uh, and how do you bring non-developers into the thinking of an open source project? That is something I, I'm really asking questions about at the, at the moment because a lot of the money when it comes to software today is also with the people who are the end users, especially maybe in our uh, CMS world where you know the agencies get money from people who can't build websites themselves. That's why they hire agencies, right? Uh, how do we involve those in our needs and uh, uh, development? Before we move on, Emil, one more? Or you've got the mic, do you wanna add something to that? <laughs> ah, okay, <laughs> okay cool. <laughs> so um, on stage are at least three CMSs that are semi in the same space, uh, or sorry to say CMSs, but Johan used to be active in uh, Joomla. Um, uh, we are active in Typo, right? And someone in Drupal, right? How can we collaborate without really being a competitor? Because in, in a way, we, there's only one euro that every customer has, so in a way, we're competitors. That we have to acknowledge that as well. But we have more in common to share than we have for competing. So how can the three, four unlimited CMSs or projects collaborate towards the EU politics, towards technology, towards licensing towards communities how can we grow um, as it uh, as the world but at least as the open source world i can i can start that uh, i don't know if i have the answer but one thing that i keep saying in my talks is beware of the difference between compete against and compete with i think we're all happily competing on you know delivering the best solution to clients, for example. I think uh, one of the things that we in the CMS world need to get better at is knowing each other. Because I think sometimes we, we hold too tightly onto our solutions and we say that, well, our solution is the only, and that is also not good for the, for the client. And I think sometimes being humble and saying, well, hey, for this project, what we need is actually better uh, done in Drupal than in Typo3. That's, uh, that's one thing that we can actually help each other with because it makes hopefully more satisfied um, customers because we don't try to fit something into a box where it doesn't really fit. The other uh, thing that we need to, to do is to understand that where this competition is actually happening. And I think, uh, you know, 66% uh, of the Drupal core uh, dependencies are also dependencies we use in Typo3, right? We can't compete on that, right? So the competition actually happens, I think, more in uh, the agency space, in the expertise space as well, who are actually best at delivering a solution with a given piece of software. Um, yeah. I think it's very important that we look at the power of lobbyists. Uh, if you talk about European Union uh, for open source in general, there's Open Forum Europe, and they are lobbying for open source in general, so they should not have a preference for one or the other uh, CMS as long as it is open source. Um, challenge there is that um, they are highly, highly undernumbered compared to uh, proprietary uh, uh, software lobbyists. So um, we really have to guard that uh, public money, public code, for example, that that is really um, coming through from the European guidelines to country uh, uh, spending money to tenders. And that is where, at the moment, we are um, yeah, working hard to get that done. So 
uh, keep on all of us promoting uh, Open Forum Europe and um, uh, maybe we need something in the Netherlands like a open source uh, business club or something where again there is a uh, high level independent uh, representation for a lobbyist for uh, open source in uh, public money, public code. I can add to that because it's one of the things we discovered uh, now working with the Open Website Alliance, working towards you know the Open Forum Europe and the EU legislation is uh, open source is different depending on how you look at it. And a lot of the big open source organizations are organizations that work on, what should we say, server level. You can compile Linux, uh, those kind of things. And when we talk about CMSs, we're in a different space that can operate differently within the EU. Uh, I'm from Norway, so <laughs> I want the EU to function because they <coughs> they just provide the laws and we say yes uh, without having any say. But what uh, a CMS does is actually that we're much, much closer to the small to medium-sized business owners, for example, than what uh, Red Hat and SUSE and the Linux Foundation are. They are more remote to that part. Uh, and we can work, again, by knowing our clients better. We can also help create uh, visibility of the needs of open source and the value it's creating. And we're, yeah, I mean, 50% of small to medium sized business websites, I would say, in Europe are based on Joomla, Type of Tree, Drupal, WordPress. So we actually have a pot potential to really make a change. So we did win. Oh yes, yeah, that, no, that's where we have one, but we haven't actually told people uh, <laughs> that you know that that they are using us properly or what they can. Uh, I'll, add, I'll add a yeah. little bit. Um, I think <laughs> collaboration-wise, um, with PHP community, with Composer, with Symphony, there is an enormous amount of collaboration where we are not even aware of. Because if I make a contribution to Symphony, it flows into Drupal. So, I, and I did, so I contribute to Drupal, right? which is another thing that I can put on my t-shirt. Um, so, you know, that, that um, which is actually nice, thinking about it. Um, good, so that, that's there. Uh, I completely agree with you. Um, the CMS systems are a little bit different in the open source landscape because we are um, both project, community, and also product. We are very close to an end user, and that creates this, like, layered complexity in, in a sense, while other um, open source technologies don't have that. If you're a library, for example, or if you're a low level something in the ecosystem, then you don't have that diversity. So collaboration for us in a way is inter interesting. And what you were saying is that we should know each other more. I completely agree because I have no idea how Typo 3 works. Uh, so we should. Do cool stuff and tell the world about it. That's at least what I took from the Dries keynote um, and, and from you as well. Um, is there one more there's, no, let me tell you there's time for one more question from the audience is there a question someone's had a question short one no one can I get a big hand of applause for the <laughs> best panel ever thank you so much <laughs>